Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Geomapping to Enhance Equitable Access uh, session. Uh, my name is Frank Tanza. I'm based at Africa Health Research Institute and University of KwaZulu Natal. And uh, my co chair is Suzui Saito, who's based at ICAP Columbia. Uh, she's an epidemiologist who's used geospatial analyses. So it's, it's a great pleasure. We have um, some really good posters lined up. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll call up Suzui to introduce the first speaker. Hello. Okay. Um, the first speaker is Anthony Waluru. Uh, he is a surveillance epidemiologist working with the branch of epidemiology, surveillance, and bioinformatics at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Kenya. He has background training in public health research, epidemiology, biostatistics, and bioinformatics, and he will be presenting a poster entitled, Where Are the HIV Positives in Kenya? Unmasking Testing Yield in a Spatial Context. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. So uh, our topic is uh, where the HIV positives in Kenya and masking testing yield in a special context, and this data for 2016. Uh, as we are, uh, are aware about the UNAIDS 1990 targets, uh, the aim is to provide a framework for assessing coverage uh, of HIV testing, uh, linkage to care, and of course, eventually, viral suppression. Uh, in Kenya, the bulk of uh, HIV testing services is aligned to the five uh, highest burden uh, counties, uh, Nairobi, Homabe, Kisumu, Siaya, and Migori. Uh, and we were asking the question, is it true then that high yielding sites are in those uh, high burden counties? And geospatial analysis is a, is a way to help us to uh, do location focused HTS planning uh, to increase diagnosis and also uh, reach the first 90. So what did you do and what were the results? Uh, data was routine data from uh, uh, HTS program and uh, yield was uh, in absolute numbers. And we used Moran's I, uh, Moran's index, uh, to perform spatial outcorrelation analysis over HTS yield by site and locality. In the figure, on the left, you can see the uh, spatial distribution of uh, clustering identified as uh, hotspots, uh, high yielding sites next to high yielding sites in red, uh, high yielding sites next to low yielding sites uh, in uh, orange, uh, low yielding sites to, uh, next to high yielding sites, and low yielding sites next to low yielding sites. Uh, and we further assessed uh, this uh, in terms of the counties that I um, talked about, Homabi, Kisumu, um, Siaya, and uh, Kisumu. And you can see that most of the sites that were high yielding were next to the uh, lake, Lake Victoria. And uh, in Nairobi were clustered around the middle of uh, the county. Uh, however, for the lower burden region, uh, on the further uh, right lower corner, uh, you can see that they were clustered around uh, highways. Most of the sites uh, showed no clustering, uh, and of the sites that had high yield, about 70% of them were in the high powder counties. Take home messages uh, IHIV burden, SNUs contain most high yielding sites. As I've said, uh, about 30% of them, of the high-yielding sites, however, lie in low burden SNUs. Uh, access to HTS is needed everywhere in Kenya. However, targeting may be difficult, uh, as you know, in our uh, paper environment, in low prevalence areas. Geospatial analysis help us to define hotspots and priority areas, therefore, uh, and we can enhance our HTS strategies. Using this information, it's possible to especially refine targeting uh, for our country operational plans and achieve the first 90. And 
we would like to acknowledge uh, Pay for Kenya, of course, our Ministry of Health, CDC, and the University of Bergen for supporting um, this analysis. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I'd like to call up Nate Hurd now, uh, who will be presenting on the patterns of HIV in the Lake Victoria region, a spatial temporal analysis. Uh, and Nate is the GIS lead of the Office of the US Global AIDS Coordinator in Health Diplomacy. Nate received a Master of Science and Doctor of Science degree in Global Health and Population from the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by recognizing my co-authors, uh, Gina Sarfiti, Christine Fellens, and Iram Zaidi, and uh, I'm fortunate that, uh, that two of them are uh, here with us today, uh, able to join us. So over the past few years, the PEPFAR program has made intensive use of uh, subnational indicator to better focus the programming that, that we support. And typically we're analyzing data at a district level. Uh, and it was, it was actually quite excellent to see Anthony's presentation uh, using facility level data. Uh, one of the questions that we're interested in is how stable are uh, spatial structures that we see uh, in the data uh, over time? So now that we have a growing time series of quarterly data, uh, we have an opportunity to explore uh, whether a hot spot or a cold spot that we observe in the data uh, is stable uh, over uh, extended periods. And we're also interested in cross-border analysis. So we're wanting to look for patterns that might not be apparent uh, just by looking at uh, data for a particular country. So our study seeks to characterize the stability of identified uh, clusters of HIV positivity in the Lake Victoria Basin. And we selected this area because the counties and districts that border the lake, uh, as, as Anthony mentioned, uh, have among the highest HIV prevalence uh, of their respective countries. We selected PEPFAR-supported health facilities within 50 kilometers of the lakeshore. Um, and then we aggregated facility-level testing data to a mesh of tessellated hexagons, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, uh, in order to, to calculate HIV positivity. And then we repeated this process for eight quarters and uh, tested those data for spatial structure. So these are not health facilities, uh, they're uh, tessellated hexagons. And hexagons are really an excellent way of presenting a large volume of data from thousands of health facilities. Uh, and it also serves the function of masking the precise location of individual health facilities. So each one of these dots is, uh, is, about, is a little less than five kilometers across uh, it's, it's 20 square kilometers uh, each. Okay. So what you're seeing on the left is HIV positivity, uh, and the quarters are cycling through uh, with, this, with this animated GIF. And on the right is spatial clustering. So what a red dot says is that there's high HIV positivity surrounded by more high HIV positivity. And similarly, these, these blue spots are uh, low, uh, areas of low value that have a spatial structure. They cluster together. Uh, and what we observe here uh, are at least four areas of persistent uh, high HIV positivity. Uh, you'll notice um, certainly the Kalangala Islands are persistently uh, showing that structure you see in Tebe and a little bit of Kampala, I believe, um, on the, the northeast of Tanzania, there's a, a persistent spot there. And also what appears to be a persistent cold spot that crosses the border of uh, Kenya and Uganda. And I should point out that an area might appear cold in relation to the lake as a whole, but be a hot spot 
within its own country. Okay? So this is relative to a, uh, a global mean, if you will. It really depends upon how we group these data uh, uh, as far as the patterns that we observe. So for a statistical analysis, this really is kind of a quick and dirty approach. Uh, we're using program data, which can be messy. Um, a, a cold spot might appear simply because many, many people were tested there uh, in that given area, right? Um, uh, it's not a proper surveillance study, if you will. Uh, but I think there are programmatically useful insights here. Um, even though there's a fair amount of labor-related mobility in the area, uh, HIV testing shows detectable and persistent spatial clusters uh, over space and time, and that can help us inform our programming. This is an analysis that we can do uh, on a quarterly basis uh, again. So high population mobility complicates uh, linkage to care and the maintenance of individuals on treatment. Uh, but I think that consistently high testing positivity in fixed places suggests that a geographically informed approach to, uh, to the program is going to be an important part of the local response uh, in this region. And I'm hopeful that more people will start to look at the temporal aspect of the data that we're collecting uh, and also consider multiple geographic scales of analysis uh, and cross-border as well as internal disease dynamics. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nate. Our next speaker is Dr. Purvi Shah, uh, who leads the implementation uh, to reach key populations at FHI 360 um, uh, and, and using ICT focus, information communication technology focusing on defining and developing the outreach intervention model to link online populations to HIV testing and treatment. She has a, he, she has a master's in psychology and 12 years of experience of working in key populations in India and she is here to present an abstract titled Density Mapping of Dating Apps Users Across Time and Space in Mumbai, India. Okay. okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I would like to start by uh, introducing my project. Uh, so Linkages um, is USAID and PEPFAS flagship project that addresses prevention, care, and treatment for key populations. Um, just to give you all a little background before I start my slides, uh, the prevention program in India has been very strong over the last few decades uh, uh, by reaching out to key populations in physical hotspots or physical spaces. Uh, but now, as we know, key populations are not to be found uh, in physical spaces. They are moving online. They prefer to use social platforms and dating apps to find their partners and clients. And uh, these clients and these populations are not uh, being reached currently by the targeted interventions or the, or the NGOs that, that work with the national program. So Linkages developed this new programmatic method uh, to map density of users on dating apps. We used Grindr, and so this particular presentation is relevant only to MSM population. Uh, we implemented the density mapping by using the same method that any average user would use to, to look around for people around him. Uh, this process collects data on the number of online users that we would have in a particular geographic location at equidistant points. This kind of data can be used uh, to guide outreach workers on where and when to set their GPS locations in order to target uh, target their outreach. It can also help the outreach workers to set targeted ads on various social media platforms so that we can reach maximum populations online. And it can obviously estimate the number of people that are active online in particular locations at particular times. Before I move on to uh, my next slide to show you the results, I want to uh, talk about a few disclaimers. We consulted the MSM communities and networks in India to prior, uh, uh, prior to implementing the data collection uh, to ensure that no data that we collected uh, would, would, uh, would go against any of the app users or the MSM community at large. 
No individual data was ever collected through this process and the presentation of the data is not granular enough to identify individuals on field. This is a programmatic method that seeks to understand where can we find this key population so that, to target, so that we can target outreach uh, efforts towards them. Here are two samples uh, of uh, snap, sample snapshots of the density mapping that we conducted in Mumbai. Uh, they represent the average density over, uh, over a day as well as over a week. The picture on the left uh, shows the density mapping done by plotting, uh, by plotting points uh, one kilometer apart from each other, whereas the picture on the right shows the density mapping results uh, by plotting the points 500 meters apart from each other. The latter was a result of improved methodology that we realized uh, because smaller distances on the radius helped the data collector to view more profiles in denser locations, and uh, that is the reason we changed our methodology later. Uh, in a city like Mumbai, which is, uh, which is surrounded by water, uh, we realized that when we plotted points near the sea, we saw that we were receiving lower intensity in those areas. It was, it was because half of the radius that we had plotted were, was covered by water bodies. So we had to move, uh, I mean, we, have, we had to plot the points in a way that we could grab smaller radiuses and get uh, more density in terms of populations. So this video basically shows the changes in density um, across a, uh, on a day as well as across a week. We did this three times a day and seven times a week uh, to see uh, what are the kind of changes in density that we can see across the geography. The top left corner denotes the time and the day uh, at which this density occurred. And uh, it was observed that during the weekends, the northern Mumbai was, was seen to be more dense because those are the areas that are, that are more residence-oriented uh, areas, whereas in the weekdays, we saw that uh, the, the population moved southwards because those are the places where people usually go for work. The HIV program in India has benefited through these approaches, and uh, it, has, it has helped the stakeholders value, uh, value the whole concept of reaching populations online and therefore have, a, have an entire outreach plan for them. It is also important to note that uh, we need to ensure that while we are doing outreach on dating apps, we need to, uh, we need to respect the communities, we need to respect that their need might be different and not just related to HIV and health because it's a dating app after all. So let's respect all that. And uh, with that, I would like to end my presentation. I would like to thank uh, all the MSM communities, the PLHIV networks, um, uh, our partners, Linkages, um, PEPFAR, USAID, all the Linkages partners, especially Hamsafa Trust, um, for, for helping us and supporting us with this initiative. I would also like to thank uh, Ben, who is also the primary author who is right here. Um, without him, this would not have been possible, this and this. So thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bobby. Um, next, I'd like to ask um, Sarah Greenwood to, to take the podium. Uh, Sarah is a researcher, researcher at HERO in Johannesburg. Her research interests include geospatial modeling, health economics, and models of healthcare financing. And she's going to be speaking on optimizing access for the last mile, geospatial cost model for point of care viral load instrument placement in Zambia. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have done some analysis on looking at a geospatial model for viral load point-of-care placement in Zambia. So just some background, um, a number of countries across Africa have been rapidly scaling up their viral load monitoring programs. But to date, little attention has been paid to how to optimize viral load access to the last mile facilities. So these are the most remote and hard to reach facilities. Um, equally, um, little attention has been paid to the role that new point-of-care testing technologies can play in facilitating this access. In a previous analysis, we used data from the Zambian Viral Load Monitoring Program to develop a national blood sample transportation network. This network um, ensured that 90% of the viral load volumes in the country were routed to the centralized labs. So, while it was an efficient system, 
it was not necessarily equitable because um, only 54% of ART treating facilities in Zambia were reached with this network. So the focus of this analysis is on that subset of facilities that were not reached by our modeled sample transportation network. So we compared the cost of placing point-of-care instruments at or near these facilities to the cost of integrating these facilities into an expanded national transportation um, network. So to do this, we developed a geospatial model that first used cluster analysis to identify candidate point-of-care facilities. So these are facilities that um, are both remote and low volume. Um, next, we use location allocation to optimally locate the point-of-care instruments such that viral load coverage and instrument utilization was maximized. So the output from this geospatial model was then incorporated into a cost model to determine the total test cost and transport cost um, across three different scenarios. So the three scenarios that we looked at was um, point-of-care placement at all the facilities that we identified for point of care, as point-of-care candidates. So this is our kind of our true point-of-care scenario. The second scenario is where we combine true point-of-care and point-of-care at near facilities. So a, a facility would act as a point-of-care hub for the facilities immediately surrounding it. And then third, we looked at integrating these facilities into our um, modeled centralized um, transport network. So results, um, 675 facilities were not reached by our previously modeled sample transportation network. So this is just under half of all ART treating facilities in Zambia. Um, 337 of these 675 facilities were identified as point of care candidates. So they had low volumes and they were in remote areas. Um, so while, whilst these facilities represent just under a quarter of all ART treating facilities, they only represent 3.2% of total viral load demand. Um, yeah, there, there they are there. Um, so we found that our scenario two, which is our combination of true and near point of care scenario, outperforms our other two scenarios. So it is 19%, um, the cost per test is 19% lower than in scenario one. And this is primarily due to better instrument utilization. So in the true point-of-care scenario, it's the instrument utilization is only 10%, whereas in our point-of-care and point-of-care hub scenario, it's at 26%. And then the cost per test in scenario two is 53% lower than our scenario three, and this is due to lower transport costs. So we have used a novel geospatial modeling approach that has shown that point-of-care viral load testing may reduce the cost are providing testing to the most remote, hardest to reach populations. And this is despite the cost of equipment and low patient volumes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maika Domingo, uh, who is a data analyst and data visualization expert. Uh, for more than two years at Callan Lord Community Health Center. Micah has evaluated gaps in care and used GIS to explore geospatial health data. He is currently working towards a certificate at Pratt uh, for GIS and design, and he will be speaking to us about uh, transgender resource mapping. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Micah Domingo. Um, as she said, I work at Cowan Lord Community Health Center, which is a community health center in Chelsea in New York City. Um, and it's a community health center that's mostly catered to LGBTQ population in New York City. We serve about 20,000 patients a year, and about a quarter of those, or about 5,000, are transgender patients. So what we wanted to do was uh, create a way for our transgender patients to navigate the complex um, and often unnavigable uh, industry in, the, in New York City, basically the medical and social support services of New York City. Um, 
People of transgender experience often have difficulty finding and receiving services that will treat them with respect and dignity. Some of the barriers to care are subpar treatment from medical and mental health professionals who either don't know or don't care. Um, there's also discrimination in law and practice depending on where you are. And overburdened case managers who often are the ones who are mostly responsible for helping trans people get through the system. Um, so with a grant from Cardo, which is a uh, GIS website, we've created the Trans Atlas. Uh, it's a geospatial tool to connect TGNB, transgender and gender non-binary people, to trans competent care across New York City. I gathered the info from the Callan Lord's own transgender resource guide, which we update every year, um, New York City's list of resources for people living with HIV and AIDS, and some smaller guides that I found related to LGBTQ wellness that includes alternative health care. And this is just a little screenshot of what it looks like. Um, full disclosure, it has not officially launched yet, but it should be launched in the next month. Um, and we have provided all of these inform this information for people uh, so you can click on any of those dots and get all of this information. And all of the dots are, um, they're, they're by service type, so we have things like youth services, elder services, sexual health services, housing services, legal services, you name it. Um, we really wanted to make sure that trans people were seen as whole people and not just bodies. And so some things to note, um, more than 70% 70 70 of Callum Lord's web traffic comes from uh, uh, mobile access, mobile devices. Um, so we really needed to cater that, and that's why this project has sort of um, had to be delayed by a month. We had to cater it to our web traffic and make it mobile ready. Um, and the majority of people who use the, webs, the web nowadays are using it through mobile access, and the majority of trans and LGBTQ youth especially are finding all their stuff through mobile web. Um, and again, want to expand the focus beyond medical needs and HIV services specifically so that we can sort of make people feel like they're whole people. Um, the other thing I really realized is that categor categorizing is really complicated, um, especially when you're dealing with things that have multiple different service types. Um, you just really want to cater it to your audience. And you want to keep the needs of key populations as a top priority, always. Um, so the next steps, I want to expand this uh, to not just include New York City, but the tri-state area, which is New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York State, um, as well expand it to the U.S. and then to the world. Um, and then we want to create a, a filter where you, people can use ratings and comments so that the communities can sort of put their input in, because this is a map that's made by trans people for trans people, and that's the most important thing. Um, and then it's replicable for different populations. So if you wanted to replicate this at any place in your city, in your state, in your country, in your county, um, it's very easily replicable. And there are just some technical modifications and improvements. So if you want to reach me, you can email me at the, web, at the link on the bottom. Thank you. Thanks, Micah. Um, so for our last speaker, there's been a speaker change. Um, this, uh, Catherine Brokenshaw Scott is going to deliver the address, um, and she is a senior technical manager at Interhealth. And she'll be talking about the use of geographic information system mapping for scaling up voluntary medical male circumcision services in Tanzania. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to all the speakers for some fun. Is this on? It's some yeah. fantastic presentations. A question for Nathan, or two. One technical in your mapping the hexagons, were you looking at um, population density as a denominator to understand the need? And kind of asking you to unpack a little bit the, you, you make the statement which many of us make about this has implications for resource allocation. Could you try and unpack that and see how you might see that data being used? I'm particularly thinking in the context of you know, the move towards testing outside of the facilities, home based testing, self-testing, how all that might into play of that. Thanks very much. Do you want to take a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah let's sure. take another question. Then. Yeah, uh, I just want to say excellent presentations, all of you. I think particularly with respect to the New York study with the transgender resource map, I was just wondering whether you had any concerns about, firstly, the publications of such maps. So we, we had problems with our Google spatial maps highlighting areas of risk behaviors, for example, although this information was available the Freedom of Information Act, but actually publishing in medical journals. And so it just, our departments had concerns about local dwellers and residents realizing they were in areas of, say, discarded needle use or risk behavior. I was wondering whether you had any 
problems with that, with regard to the studies that you did in terms of publishing the maps and um, highlighting the areas that you, you very eloquently discussed? So let's take one more question. Yeah, just a quick follow-on for Nate. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the porousness of the borders uh, between those three countries? Thanks. Okay, you guys want to respond? I'll start with that. Okay. okay. Um, so on the first question, one of the limitations of this study is that it does not include <coughs> some of our community-based uh, outreach. So uh, there's a, a whole array of outreach that, that takes place at the community level, um, which is harder for us to locate geospatially, right? So uh, if it takes place in a school, if it takes place uh, perhaps at the dock, uh, if you will. Um, so the denominator uh, for this study, it is uh, the indicator denominator of people who are tested uh, at those locations. Uh, so um, uh, another term that we sometimes use is, is the yield of a facility, uh, but this is merely the number of HIV positive tests over the, the total number of tests administered at that site. Um, and with regard to uh, you know, what can we do with, with these data, um, another limitation of, uh, of these data is that we're really counting the number of tests that are administered in a given quarter. And we're not tracking individuals. Um, so we may, if someone's tested multiple times uh, in the same place or in different places, that's going to affect um, our, um, our, our insight into what's happening in a, in, a, in a localized area. However, it's still very important for us to know where we're finding people uh, it could be that uh, we are testing the same people and not uh, getting those folks into uh, care and, and sustaining them on, on care. Uh, so it's, it's a signal, uh, and it, it does tell us something valuable about uh, where we're, we're finding uh, large numbers of, uh, of HIV-positive people and where perhaps we need to to, to focus our attention. So it's perhaps uh, just one step in a, in a process. Um, and then with regard to the porousness of, of borders, uh, that's an excellent question. There is uh, a, a fair amount of labor-related mobility around uh, the fishery uh, of Lake Victoria itself, as well as uh, plantation related work, seasonal uh, labor related mobility uh, around uh, agriculture uh, in the area. And uh, so there's a lot of movement uh, with the lake being an important highway, if you will. Uh, I have less insight into uh, the, the, uh, exactly how porous uh, the, the borders are, though. Um, but it's a way of saying I don't know. Okay, thanks, Micah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, thank you for the question. It's actually something that I definitely thought about while I was uh, creating this um, resource map. Um, but, but working at Cal and Lord, because we are such uh, a visible part of the community, um, and, and all the resources on the map are all visible resources. These are all resources that are not necessarily mapped out, um, but they're put in our resource guide, and it's published publicly every year. So it's, it is definitely something to think about, but if you, if you say that we're worried about people's safety um, and versus people's actual access to care, then the access to care sort of um, trumps all of that. Thanks. We got some more questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tim Master with FHI 360. I mean, it's so exciting to see these data, and I sort of get the sense that we're sort of in the first phase of understanding what do we do with this sophisticated data. <clears throat> but I've got a question for, for Pervy. Uh, if you just inform, how large is Mumbai population wise? What's the estimated number of MSM in Mumbai? And now you know where people are moving around, at least the ones using Grindr, where they move around at time of day and days of the week. How is that going to be used to optimize your HIV prevention services? Thank you for that question. Um, so we estimated, uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we did a survey uh, where we estimated around 16 million uh, 
men in Mumbai, 18 plus, out of which around 234,000 MSMs. Uh, Could you convert lakh to uh, sorry, two hundred and thirty-four thousand. I'm sorry, two hundred and thirty-four thousand. Okay. Uh, of them were MSM in Mumbai, and uh, uh, so we are, uh, like I explained, we are going to use this data to help our virtual outreach workers uh, provide prevention messages to this population. We have this entire system called Yes for Me, which we've just launched two uh, two months back where uh, the virtual outreach workers send out messages to, to these populations. And uh, it's basically on prevention, on, uh, it's a website where you log in, you do a very short risk assessment, and you can book yourself an appointment for HIV test. And uh, that's how we are linking people from online to offline. And then once we have them offline, once they come in for a test, we have a follow-up system wherein they are linked to treatment. Sorry, treatment if they are found positive, and if they are negative, they are re-engaged in the program again, in the prevention program again. So we, ha we have that thing set up already. So about a quarter of a million MSM in Mumbai, do you think? Estimated. 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 <laughs> yeah, well, just that's a big ball. That's a lot of people. What, what's the HIV prevalence in MSM in Mumbai? It's around 7%. Seven, 7 oh, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I just have a follow-up question uh, for Pervi and also to Anthony. Um, so both of your analyses kind of looked at, at yield and total numbers. Um, do you have any idea the extent to which kind of population density is driving that and the extent to which there, there's some areas with a disproportionate you know, numbers of MSM using Grindr and, and in your case, test, testing yield? Um, there, there are areas which were disproportionate in terms of uh, Grinder users, but what we found in Mumbai was the maximum number of users were on Grinder. So, whatever we could we could see was, I wouldn't say disproportionate, but um, we, it gave us a fair idea about where these people are. So, to target us, to target them. So, in the case of Kenya analysis. Uh, we didn't uh, weight uh, this data by population, uh, and therefore you've got no idea, you know, uh, how population uh, impacts on the data. Okay. Yeah, right. so, the presentation's ready. Yeah. so we, we, the presentation has been uploaded. Um, so we'll, um, so if you wouldn't mind holding your questions just for a little bit, and we'll go to the, the last presentation and then resume the, the questions. So where's Catherine? She's there. Oh. Hey. Uh, okay, so, so, so maybe I'll just take that right back. Um, so continue with your questions, please, sorry. Hello, thank you for those presentations. So my question has to do with the density mapping app in Zambia. I'm sorry, in India, Mumbai. I think it's a really cool idea to be able to density map by time and space. And especially if you want to target your interventions to where your congregations are largest for your target population. But I was wondering, what were the challenges you encountered in terms of privacy concerns? either by the participants or by the governments, and how did you get around those? Yeah, sure. So um, this entire data collection, like I said, uh, does not collect any individualized data. So we don't know which individual or which MSM is from a particular spot. We do not have any individualized data collected during this entire process. So we are not um, em embarking on anybody's privacy. Uh, this was just done to understand where should we target our outreach efforts? In what areas should we target our outreach efforts? Because online space is huge. There are thousands of people online. It's not like the physical spaces where you can find a group of people. So we just wanted to understand so that we could best use our resources. We did this so that our target should be on those areas where there are denser, uh, I mean, there are more number of users. But in, in terms of privacy, like I said, we don't have any such data which can, which can embark upon anybody's privacy. And this was explained to the government, and they, uh, and they were pretty uh, okay with this whole thing. Hi, I actually I have a related question. Meg Davis from the Health and Human Rights Journal. Um, while you know it's great that you consulted with the communities and it sounds like you've really thought through those questions about privacy, but I think for certainly for your presentation and for the other two, I'm still left with some questions about informed consent because somebody who signs on to Grinder does not necessarily consent knowingly to having their data used for this purpose. So doesn't that raise some kind of troubling questions? Uh, again, because we don't have any individual data uh, and we're not collecting anybody's 
personal location for, uh, on uh, while accessing Grinder. We are only using the exactly the same method that a Grinder user would use to look at people around. So we just use that kind of data. We've not used any special technology or any any special data through Grinder, uh, which would you know have any privacy issues for anybody. So we we made sure we ensured uh, while our consultations with the with the community that uh, we are using a methodology that was used by them and that we are not uh, having any privacy related issues. Thank you. Great. So Catherine, you like to set up um, yes. and just take two. Yeah. While you're doing that, I just have a quick question for Sarah. Um, so I, I really liked your approach of trying to optimize for the last mile, and it's not often you see optimization targeting the difficult to reach populations. And so just a practical question, have your results, when you've presented them, have they had a good impact or is this likely to be taken up? I mean, will it lead to some change? Uh, we hope so. <laughs> um, currently, there's no point of care validated in Zambia. Um, I think a layer Q has just come out, um, but there is talk of how to now think about these harder to reach populations. So we haven't presented it to the Ministry of Health as yet. Thanks. Good to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience. My name is Catherine Brokenshire Scott, and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague, Kijun Yali Lali. Um, I'm presenting a poster called Use of Geographic Information System Mapping for scaling up VMMC services in Tanzania. Regrettably, my colleague couldn't come. She couldn't get a visa to present, so um, it's kind of sad for her, um, but I hope next time she'll be able to present her own um, information. So studies have demonstrated that VMMC reduces HIV transmission in men by 60%, and WHO and UNAIDS have recommended VMMC as a comprehensive HIV package in 14 priority countries, including Tanzania. IntraHealth International, with PEPFAR CDC funding, is supporting the government of Tanzania to strengthen and accelerate VMMC services. However, this far in the epidemic, it's hard to find those uncircumcised men when 80% of the population in Tanzania, men, are circumcised. So we use GIS information and um, dialogue with community experts and to identify geographical areas where we could do um, demand creation and uh, targeted service delivery. So here you have our ambitious PEPFAR targets for circumcisions. Um, we're on our way to reaching 320,000 men. Um, as I said, it's getting harder the more we've done it. So the process we used was we got ward level male population data from four intra-health supported regions and shape files with geo-referenced points like ward boundaries, rivers, hills, and we extracted geo-coordinates of health facilities from the National Health Facility Registry and Datum GIS. We then subtracted service delivery data, so all the men who have been circumcised in a catchment area, we subtracted that from the population of the area, and we created maps. And what we found was in 61% 60, of the uncircumcised men were in 40% of the wards. So we learned to target our um, demand creation. And what we did with this map was we went and talked to community stakeholders and we got information from them about smaller areas that had access to roads or that had water or electricity for sterilization of equipment. Um, and we did our campaigns in these red dots and we sent in um, demand creation experts for six weeks and we went, we canvassed the entire area, and then we set up tents in these hard to reach geographic areas and did for more circumcisions. So what we've learned from this is that maps are a really good idea to figure out where your gap is and to map it. Talking to communities is really important to get that even more granular pieces of information. 
Um, and this can be used in all different service areas, not just VMMC. Thanks. Are there any other questions from the audience or Catherine and others? Hi there. Um, Catherine, that was really interesting. Thank you. I have uh, just a quick question. So you looked at the number of men who had been circumcised in a clinic and then subtracted that from the total population. Right. right. We, we had um, ward level data. The smallest unit was the ward. And so we uh, clustered together the clinics and the catchment areas and took their service statistics from 2011 to 2017. Okay. So then we found the gap. Okay, so did you do, so I'm wondering how mobile the population is. Is it possible that what you were actually capturing was which clinics men preferred to go to? Could people have just been traveling to clinics they liked better rather than the local one? Um, it could be. Uh, what we found with VMMC is that the smallest number of VMMCs are done in clinics, that we do most of them in tents because we're going to these rural, hard-to-reach areas. So yes, there's mobility with fishermen and, and on routes with, with trucks, but um, that's a really good point, and I think we'll look into that to see if that is indeed the case. Thank you. I actually have a question for Anthony and Nate. Um, have you done, so you've presented sort of testing data uh, today, but I was curious whether you've done any similar work um, on viral load or recency um, testing and ha do geospatial mapping on, on that. So on viral load suppression, I would encourage everyone to visit the PEPFAR uh, booth because I'm pretty sure that there is a, a cycling set of, of viral load suppression maps that we were highlighting there, uh, particularly because it's something that we haven't historically uh, mapped uh, uh, before and are really delighted to be able to, to present that um, to everyone who visits the, the PEPFAR booth. Yeah. Hi, uh, Stephen Delgado, ICAP at Columbia. Um, I, I found it interesting. We saw three different approaches to hotspot mapping or spatial clustering. Density mapping for, for Pervy, uh, Nathan, Getasor, GI, Star, uh, Anthony, Morin's Eye, and then Frank, in an earlier session, you used the spatial scan statistics. So I'm curious, given the methods out there, what are sort of your guiding principles for making methodological, methodological decisions of, in terms of your method of choice? Okay, let's just let Anthony respond to the previous one, and then we'll carry on. Um, for the first, uh, the previous question, I think I just take it like a, a comment, and uh, it's a good thing to think about doing recently uh, as well. Um, so regarding the methods, I think uh, uh, the simpler, the better, because uh, it depends on who, who is going to do the analysis. Uh, and this can be translated into like training materials for uh, folks out there to uh, be able to analyze uh, data, especially. Great, thanks, Anthony. Nate, do you want to respond to the methods one? Um, one of the things that we'd like to be able to do in the future is um, uh, test for uh, that temporal component you know, in, in the same test uh, uh, process. Uh, but I, I would second Anthony's point that there's, uh, that there's value in um, uh, working with the toolbox that, that we have within uh, ArcGIS. Um, so there are more, uh, perhaps, I mean, there are many alternative approaches, but uh, yeah, we were essentially working within the, the ArcGIS toolbox and looking for uh, a tool that would uh, provide us that contrast of, of of hot and, um, and low. Uh. For me, I think the, metho the methodology um, has to be something that, um, that does not infringe upon privacy of the community because we are looking at community here at, I mean, as my prime concern. So um, I would look at a methodology that is very simple, that does not give me any 
private data or does not uh, make the community uh, concerned about my methodology, as well as I would like to use a methodology that can be replicable and scalable by the government at various other locations. So that's the kind of methodology that I would look at. And this is very simple to do. Uh, anybody can do it. An outreach worker can do it as well. So. Yeah, maybe just, just from my perspective, I mean, I think there's, there's immediately a decision point in terms of whether we're doing this for an epidemiological analysis and whether we want to attain statistical significance or whether we're doing it for service delivery and we want to, you know, reach the greatest possible population um, at the least possible cost. Um, certainly from an epidemiological standpoint, um, a lot depends on whether the data is individual-based, whether you have individual geolocations. So, I mean, I always try to use... I try to avoid the techniques that uh, force one to aggregate by a specific area uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. And obviously the data sometimes comes to that. So, so if one has uh, individual level geolocated data, um, then I really like um, the spatial scan statistic approach uh, because you're most likely to detect a cluster and you're least likely to miss it if it's there. So that's the approach. But, but it's, there's always a lot of uh, sort of... Um, the things that go into a decision like that, but that's my perspective. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, it's Mary Rabkin from ICAPA Columbia. Um, uh, so this is a question, I guess, for Anthony, Nathan, and, and um, Purvi. Did you share this information back with the communities? And if so, sort of how and what was that experience like? Um, I think I mentioned that uh, some of these analysis have been used for co planning. Uh, so like, uh, COP18 planning, uh, this was partly used as, you know, a tool for planning. I mean, with the communities themselves. So did the geographic areas, no. you found hotspots, did you guys go and say, hey, you're a hotspot? <laughs> Dan says no. Thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, similarly, uh, this study is uh, exploring an approach, and uh, I think uh, you know, our objective was to see if it's a viable approach for analyzing these kinds of data, um, uh, share it here with you, and then we can present that to the country teams uh, that are uh, in partnership with, uh, with partner governments, you know, making these kinds of allocation decisions about where, where to scale up services. Yeah. Hi. Um, yes, we did disseminate this information to the community. We, we held consultations with the community where uh, the, actually the community was very excited with this kind of an approach because nothing like this has happened before in India. And uh, in fact, they wanted something uh, to be done really for reaching out to the populations online. So I think um, uh, we, we got their consensus in terms of uh, using this approach, and uh, not just that, we have consensus from our donors, USAID, as well as the government, um, who really liked this kind of an approach and uh, appreciated the fact that uh, at least there's a start. Uh, somebody has started doing something for uh, reaching populations online. Go ahead with your question. Thank you. So just a question for Kathleen. Thank you for that presentation. So I was wondering... In countries where there's still a fair to significant need for circumcision on MET, are our programs or the government tracking the incidence of circumcision at birth so as to determine future needs and perhaps eliminate them early, or we're not? Okay, if I understand your question correctly, you want to know if they're collecting data on early infant circumcision? Okay, so I'm sure the person I'm replacing at this panel could have answered that question. <laughs> Um, I do know that this project has a target of 10,000 uh, infant circumcisions starting in October, and we're in contact with West Africans because our, we have partners there, and uh, in West Africa, they do circumcise at, infant, at birth. Um, so Tanzania doesn't do that right now, and we're learning as we go, but we're looking to the other countries that have... Um, done this before. And if you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Yeah. Any further questions before we close the session? Right. Okay, well, it just remains for me to, to say thank you to the speakers. Um, it's been an excellent session, and I think what was really noteworthy was the fact a lot of these um, applications were 
designed to reach difficult to reach populations and going the last mile, which is really appropriate. So thanks to all the speakers. Thanks for your questions and a reminder that they will be at their posters and you'll be able to ask them further questions. Yeah. Um, and posters are, you want to say that? Yes, the posters are outside of room 11. 11A. 11A. So please take a look. Right. So on behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Saito, and myself, thank you very much. Thank you.